Hello and welcome to another Nesta Talks team. My name is Ravi Gurumurthy. I'm the Chief Executive of Nesta. And today we're talking about obesity and whether government gets the right to tell us what to eat. Um, as you may know, Nesta has focused on three big missions uh, over the next 10 years, one of which is about how we can reduce obesity. And our starting point is that in order to tackle obesity, you probably have to reduce people's calorie intake. That's probably not going to happen if you just encourage people to diet and assume that individuals voluntarily do that. You probably have to change the food environment. You have to make it easier for people to do the right thing. And with us today to discuss that are two people who come at the issue from quite different perspectives. We've got Dolly Tice, who is at the at Cambridge University's Medical Research Council's Epidemiology Unit. Um, and we've also got Christopher Snowden, who's at the Institute of Economic Affairs, who describes himself on his website as a writer, commentator and scourge of the nanny statists. And so we're going to be debating what drives obesity and what you can do about it. We'll kick off, first of all, with um, with Dolly and, and, and then and then uh, Christopher. We're going to say five minutes or so on their opening positions. I'll then um, ask a few questions, but it'd be great to get your comments and questions in the chat and I'll try and bring them in as we go through the uh, go through the next hour. So without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to our panelists. Um, Dolly, welcome. Let me hand over to you. Thank you so much, Ravi, and thank you so much for having me for this debate, one of my favourite topics, um, and delighted to be joined by Chris as well. Um, so I, I wanted to start off by addressing the, the title of this talk, Should the Government Get to Decide What We Eat? Now, some of you may agree with me that that's a pretty provocative and largely misleading title because the government doesn't decide what we eat. Um, if you've eaten today, I'm pretty sure the government didn't decide what it was. <laughs> um, but what it can do is it can help shape what options are available to us. So I want to flip the question and ask, should the government intervene to ensure that it's easy for everyone, regardless of circumstance, to enjoy good, nutritious food? And my answer to that is yes, everyone should be able to enjoy delicious food that doesn't then end up making us sick. Because if the balance, like it is today, of what's sold, what's marketed, what's available, is massively tilted in favour of unhealthy options, then should government intervene to help rebalance that? What about helping people be free from unhealthy food environments? If the main options around us are likely to lead to poor health outcomes, then how free really is our choice? Whether that's in our schools and high streets or supermarkets, food outlets, how easy is it to enjoy healthy, delicious food without having to think about it that much? And that's really a crucial bit, without having to think about it that much because why should it require more conscious effort and resource to eat well versus unhealthily? Why should it be hard to be healthy? So going back to the, the debate, should it be about whether or not government should intervene or should it be about why and how it should intervene? It's highly unlikely we'd even be having a whole event on this topic if there wasn't a problem in the first place, and there is. The UK diet is making us sick. Four out of the top five risk factors for healthy years of life loss to disease, disability and death are related to our diets. Four out of the top five. In other words, the UK diet is leading to disease, disability and death. But we've actually known that for decades. In fact, this year marks 30 years since the UK government announced that it would introduce policies related to obesity in particular and set targets to reduce the prevalence of obesity. And those original targets uh, back in 1992 were to reduce the obesity prevalence for men by about half to 6% and for women to 8%. So how well has the government done to achieve that? Well, the obesity prevalence for men today is not 6%, it's 26%. And for women, it's not 8%, it's 29%. Now, obesity is just one of many outcomes of our food environment and culture. And the more that we can move away from a focus on weight, 
and the more that we can move towards a focus on just better quality, delicious diets and making that easy and enjoyable for everyone, the better. And now my research has looked at those last three decades to ask why after 30 years of government obesity policies, as they are broadly known, have things not only not got better, they've got worse. And I found that although government has published 14 government obesity strategies in the last 30 years, containing almost 700 individual policies, they have largely been proposed in a way that's unlikely to lead to them being action and seen right through. So we've often had the same ideas proposed again and again, often in very um, uh, sort of conceptual, con conceptual years. In fact, we're more likely to see a government publish another obesity strategy than it is to implement, monitor and evaluate the policies that's already been proposed. I also examine how easy it is to make policy change on obesity. And essentially, it's not <laughs> very easy largely because we spend so much time debating whether government should intervene like in this event rather than getting on with actions that will actually make a better diet easy for everyone to enjoy and i imagine some of you know very well that it's also rather common for politicians to come in and be secretary of state for health or prime minister and go i know what we just need to do is tell industry to help make food healthier and they will or i know we just need to tell people to eat better and they will, despite all the evidence that shows why that doesn't work or why it's not actually as simple as that. So going back to the original debate question, should the government get to decide what we eat? No, and it doesn't. Should the government help rebalance things so the food around us doesn't end up making us sick? Yes. But how do we do that in a way that ensures that this, the actions, the ideas are done, not just publishing more ideas? And how do we ensure that policies lead to real change, i.e. that it is made easier for people, for everyone, regardless of circumstance, to enjoy a delicious, nutritious diet? Those, for me, are the more interesting questions. And those are the ones that I would like to focus on this discussion. So thank you. Thanks very much, Dolly. Um, let's turn to Christopher now. Thank you. Nice to be here virtually. Um, I, I don't actually agree that we spend too much time asking whether the government should intervene. I think it's actually quite a nice novel to be, novelty to be able to do, to do that today. Um, we don't ask that question enough with regards to obesity or indeed many other policy areas. People just jump in, they see a problem, they assume the government can solve it and, uh, and off the government goes. I think with any public policy area, you need to ask four or five questions. Um, firstly, what is the problem? Secondly, is it the government's responsibility to do something about it. Um, can the government do anything about it? Will the solutions that be, have been proposed actually work? Um, if they will work, will they actually solve the problem or will they just make it slightly better leading to the demand for even more uh, intervention? In other words, a slippery slope. What are the costs and benefits? And what are the likely unintended consequences? And with obesity, um, I don't think the solutions proposed really pass any of those tests. So firstly, is obesity actually a public policy issue? Is it a public health issue? I would say it's not, it's a, it's a personal issue. Is it a problem? Well, of course it can be, and there are undoubtedly um, health consequences from, from being uh, obese. No one, no one disputes that. We've seen that, of course, over the course of the pandemic it being an exacerbating factor. Um, but does that make it the government's business? Um, there doesn't seem to me any obvious market failures in the food supply, and it's got, we'll, we'll no doubt be exclusively talking about food today and ignoring physical activity because the government can't really do much by way of regulating physical activity. So all the focus quite wrongly is on the food supply. Um, but there isn't any obvious market failure. Um, possibly you could say people are underinformed in some areas. I think that's probably true. I would argue maybe most people underestimate how many calories there are in a pint of beer, quite possibly. But on the other hand, when mandatory calorie labeling has been brought in various jurisdictions around the world, it's been shown to make absolutely no difference. In other words, people might not know exactly how many calories there are in a chocolate biscuit, but they know that chocolate biscuits aren't health foods and they, they buy them because they like the taste of them. Um, people often bring up the, the issue of the costs of obesity to the health services is used as justification for all sorts of interventions these days. Um, and of course, there are specific 
costs that you can attribute to, to obesity. If somebody gets um, you know, type, type 2 diabetes, has to have a, a foot cut off or something, you, you can certainly argue very strongly that that wouldn't have happened had they not been obese. Uh, on the other hand, people who are obese do pay taxes like everybody else and they would have health conditions that need treating in the absence of obesity. And the evidence shows pretty clearly, I think, in, in, in most respects, that uh, in actual fact, people tend to, to, to cost more the longer they live. It's certainly true of, uh, of smoking. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence showing that it is true of obesity, or if there is a net cost, it's very small and not something that we would normally worry about were it not an issue like obesity where there's a strong moralistic element to it. Um, and then the solutions themselves, what's being proposed, will they actually work? Well, I mean, Dottie's quite right that probably lots of proposals haven't been introduced in the United Kingdom so far. They're about to be introduced. There's a whole raft of measures that are going to come in as part of the government's latest obesity strategy, food advertising bans, telling shops where they can stock their so-called unhealthy products. Um, stuff like this has been tried before certainly sugar taxes have been tried many places over the course of the last 10 15 years there's no evidence whatsoever that they reduce obesity there's remarkably little evidence actually they reduce the consumption of soft drinks and certainly uh, not much evidence that they reduce the consumption of sugar or indeed calories people tend to compensate the economic evidence of that is actually pretty pretty strong there's fairly large literature which which is ignored by advocates of, of sugar taxes because it doesn't work in their favor advertising bans in general don't reduce aggregate consumption. There have been food advertising restrictions um, in various parts of the world, not that many, um, not so many that you could say that the evidence is particularly robust, um, but we do know from other categories, other products, that uh, advertising restrictions don't really make any difference to overall consumption, which is what we're talking about here, as opposed to consumption of different brands. And we also know that the advertising ban uh, for so-called junk food on children's television, which was introduced about 15 years ago, had absolutely no effect um, whatsoever, nor indeed did Jamie Oliver's school meals program have any effect on child obesity insofar as we measure it properly, which we don't. Um, reformulation is something that we've been trying in this country over the course of the last five years or so. Uh, lots of people want to have that extended or in some way make it mandatory. Uh, they need to look at the, the last Public Health England report on sugar reduction. It was a, a hilarious uh, flop. Not because companies didn't reduce the amount of sugar in their products, a lot of them did. It's just that when they reduced the, the sugar content, people stopped buying them and they started buying more sugar, sugary products. And the net result was absolutely no increase, sorry, or the decrease in, uh, in overall sugar consumption from those products, from the, the products in the reformulation scheme, which is basically pretty much any packaged product that you can buy in a shop. In fact, overall, the amount of sugar consumed in Britain increased there are randomized control studies showing exactly the same thing for the same reason the sugar taxes don't work which is to say that people compensate people fortunately are free enough to get around these things they will follow their tastes and preferences and their tastes and preferences are not the same as those of dolly and other public health campaigners on the whole finally there is a whole systems approach when you point out to public health people that none of their policies have ever been shown to reduce obesity or even significantly reduced calorie consumption, they will say that it's naive to expect any one policy to make a difference. What you need to do is introduce lots and lots of policies and, and hope that you know, their combined weight will, you know, the, the, the sum will be greater than the, the sum of the parts, as it were. The obvious problem with this um, notion is that it makes it impossible to distinguish a policy that doesn't work from a policy that does work. And so the whole idea of evidence-based policy goes out the window in favor of just getting a smorgasbord of uh, untested policies or policies that have been tested and shown to fail and throwing them at this issue, hoping that together they will stick, um, which wouldn't be quite so bad if these policies didn't bring their own costs and create their own unintended consequences and other problems. Uh, an obvious example of that uh, is the regressive nature of, uh, of sugar taxes. There was a study came out just last week from the United States showing that 20% of households in the US pay 90% of all the sin taxes. That's taxes on soda, but also on alcohol and uh, cigarettes. These are incredibly regressive taxes go against the whole idea of health um, equalities, inequalities. Um, so that, that I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but that's my basic position that we look at these things um, through the prism of evidence-based policy. There isn't very much evidence for any of them and the justification for the government intervening in the first place is extremely weak. 
thank you very much, Christopher. Um, so you're not a fan of this approach. Um, can we just start? I mean, you've actually laid out a very helpful structure, I think, to, 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 to work through in this conversation. And I think the first point you make is, is it a problem? And you accept it's a problem, but you characterize it as one that's a personal one rather than one that justifies state intervention. Um, but surely there is a lot, there, there are big externalities, there are big social costs as a result of obesity. Does that not justify the state having some kind of role? Well, I don't think there are big social costs or, or economic costs, I mean, insofar as those two things are, are distinguishable. You will, of course, get studies coming out saying that obesity costs some vast sum of money, you know, $50 trillion or something around the world. Um, these uh, these kind of cost-benefit analyses are, are designed to be used as, as weapons in public policy debates. And if you actually drill into them, what you almost invariably find is that the vast majority of the supposed costs are neither external nor indeed financial. Um, so a very large section, usually the, the majority of the, the total figure put forward will tend to be things like um, lost productivity. And so you can say, and this doesn't apply maybe so much for obesity, uh, but it certainly is a large component. It's very much a large component with things like um, smoking and alcohol. Uh, and lost productivity can be absenteeism, but it's also um, sort of uh, another way of measuring lost years of life. So people uh, who are not alive obviously can't work. I mean, that's not, that's not an external cost in any, in any sensible definition of the word. And even if it were an external cost, even if, um, for example, if you're obese, you don't turn to work and you, you, uh, you don't get as much done, that will be reflected in your salary. I mean, there's clearly a, a link, a very strong link between what people produce and how much they earn. And so people like that will be passed over promotion. So in other words, it's an internal cost on them. The the more direct economic cost I've already mentioned with regards to the health service, um, you can always portray there being a very large cost from all sorts of different things if you ignore the counterfactual of how much would have to be spent in the absence of that problem. So in the case of obesity, um, you, you yeah, let's take the case of somebody who, you know, they're very overweight, they have a heart attack, they, they, uh, they drop dead or they need hospital, hospital care for a few weeks before they drop dead. What would they have cost had they not been obese, had they lived another 20 years and died of cancer, which is the most likely thing they would have died from. And the cancer obviously wasn't obesity related. What would the cost be there? Well, we never find out because they never include the other side of the ledger in these kind of studies. So you get a very partial view. Um, they're not really uh, cost benefit analysis because you don't actually see the benefit, which is to say the, the savings that you would see um, in, a, in a counterfactual. And, and by this principle, presumably, you would not be in favour of things like seatbelts being compulsory for the same reason. Well, I think seatbelts should be compulsory. And it's not something I'm particularly going to go to the wall for. I think, I think it's a fairly small liberty. But yeah, the, the kind of the ethical case for fining somebody for not wearing a seatbelt is very, very uh, thin, I would say. And there's actually more a case for putting seatbelts in the back seats than there is in the front seats, because if you're in the back seat, you can potentially kill the person in the front seat if you uh, if you fly th through the car. Um, but let's not get onto that. Uh, it's, a, it's, okay. a, it's a relatively so, relatively small issue, whereas I think the government control on the food environment is quite a big issue. So, Dolly, I mean, how do you see this the, you know, on, on a kind of actual case for government intervention at all in this area? Yeah, I mean, coming back to some of Chris's points, because it's there are sort of little um, signals towards the position, like what is a big liberty versus a smaller liberty and, and the role that government plays in that. And I think this whole debate area can so easily get wrapped up into the idea that the government is coming in and taking away vast um, sections of choice in relation to food and forgetting to focus so much on the positive active provision side of healthier options and making that more accessible, affordable, convenient for everyone, which is massively the focus for the, from the public health community of wanting that to be a reality for everyone. And the, the reality now is that it's not, and it's massively disproportionately tilted towards unhealthy options. So it's very far from the idea of restricting freedoms, liberties. It's actually much more in line with increasing freedom, increasing choices, increasing um, the the ability to have options that don't lead to, to negative health outcomes. And coming back down to the health side, there again tends to be more of a focus on the obesity uh, uh, um, element in particular. I was very careful to select that 
statistic around the diet related diseases, disability and death, because it's four out of the five top risk factors related to those things are about poor diets. It's not just about obesity. It's about what all poor diets can can lead to. And I think that's really important that we move away from that focus just on weight towards the quality of diets that are available to everyone. And finally, there was one thing um, uh, uh, Chris was saying in terms of the uh, interventions side and how effective they're likely to be. I mean, having been spending these past few years really looking at how, how hard it is to make policy change happen, the reality is the nitpicking of how likely each one ends up being becomes so politicised that you end up with a situation where a government will not be able, not feel that it's politically feasible to expand, for example, the soft drinks industry levy to all products that have high amounts of sugar, for example, the kind of milky drinks that you have in, in Starbucks and whatever, if I'm allowed to say any names, um, popular coffee shops um, uh, or fruit juices or things like that because of the political fear that you'll end up with a headline saying, you know, Chancellor taxes uh, milk or which we all know um, in relation to it link, its links with the 80s under Thatcher, that these sorts of things can't be as, as effective as they possibly can be because of these issues, these political issues um, and the debate around it of, of the sort of liberties. So there's a, there's a bit of a catch-22 with it that you end up in a situation with smaller scopes of policies just because of that political debate around it so they're, they're you're already reducing its ability to be as effective by that um debate in the first place so i'd be interested in i can see chris smiling interested in chris's thoughts on that of how can you possibly expect the effectiveness to occur if you're debating and reducing that scope in the first place with these kind of positions around um, sort of exacerbating the limits on freedom when we're talking about trying to create freedoms. Oh, so it's my fault these policies didn't work. I didn't realise. <laughs> I thought it was just they were ineffective, but it's actually because we're talking about it that makes them less effective. Well, in that specific example, I mean, the, the sugar tax was, I don't think people like Jamie Oliver even thought it was going to come in. I think they, they uh, used that policy to try and push the envelope really and move the Overton window so they could get other policies through. So I think it came as much of a shock to him as it did to me when George Osborne actually introduced it. But when people like Oliver were campaigning for it, they kept going on about how many children are overweight and obese with a strong implication was obviously that if you bring in the sugar tax, you won't have so many children who are overweight or obese. And well, now it's come in and it hasn't really made any difference. People say, oh, that's a terribly gauche thing to say. That's very naive to think policy would would even do something. I think it's very naive to suggest that if you extend it to milkshakes, which is basically what's being suggested, and maybe some coffees in Starbucks, um, you're going to see suddenly that this policy that's failed in every country in the world where it's been tried suddenly has an effect. And absolutely, we should be arguing about these policies because they have very significant consequences for people. And a tax on all sugary products, for example, would be yet another uh, regressive tax. The, the, the sugar taxes in in yeah, in cash terms, you need to be realistically drinking a, a huge amount of sugary drinks for it to really significantly um, affect your annual disposable income. But it's still, it could work out fifty pounds a year. I'd rather for a you know a low income family, I'd rather that fifty pounds was in their pocket rather than in the government's pocket. And if you extend that to all sugary products, or as Henry Dimbleby has suggested, to extend it to salt and I think to fat, um, then you would be looking at a very significant impact um, on everybody, actually, but of course, especially on people on low incomes who, as we also know, uh, their behaviour is least likely to change in the face of these interventions. And we've seen that very clearly with tobacco. Let's dive into this, um, the sugary drinks levy, because uh, Thomas Abrahams in the, in the chat has said, um, I hope we can touch on this because uh, he thinks it's a success. Um, and, and my understanding of, of what happened there was that when the sugary drinks levy was announced, around half um, of eligible soft drinks contained five grams or more of sugar. By the time the actual um, levy was uh, operational, all these drinks manufacturers had reformulated their drinks and taken sugar out. Only 15% of drinks sold were above that threshold. And actually, the sugary drinks levy has been really effective at taking um, sugar that's uh, often not very 
that people don't even notice out of people's uh, diet and, and, and taking a bit of calories out of people's typical um, intake. And that's my understanding of things. But Dolly, I don't know whether you can just flesh out your view of the evidence around uh, the effectiveness of the levy and then we'll come to Christopher. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you've, you've set it out in terms of the reduction was really in the sugar content around a lot of these drinks. And um, it was designed in a very clever way to make sure that it wasn't about a tax that increased uh, consumer prices, but really was about um, incentivizing manufacturers to reformulate so that they were reducing the amount of sugar and really the sort of high sugar uh, drinks and to really make sure that that was um, incentivized in a way that wasn't only punitive to the manufacturers. There, was, there were two uh, tiers of the levy so that there was a kind of top end and then you could reformulate down and pay a bit less if you hit within that middle um, point. And then anything below that, you wouldn't pay anything at all. So it was sort of really pushing um, companies to say that you actually don't end up having to pay anything at all if you do reformulate below that, that bottom rate. Um, and there has been a massive uh, reformulation effort, which was already happening, as the industry made clear before. It was sort of excelled that um, progress that was made. And coming back down to the links with certain health outcomes, it is so critical with anything with public health is to not just have one outcome, which is often the case with government strategies on this issue, that you'll just have the main target is a kind of obesity prevalence reduction, when really there are so many positives that can be had as a result of these interventions in the short, medium and long term as well. And the biggest example with the soft drinks industry levy is around dental health, which is a huge issue. The main reason why children end up in A&E is because of uh, getting their teeth extracted, which is, you know, it's a shocking statistic. Um, and yet it's something that one intervention like this, yes, you can focus on the, um, the obesity side of things or that we can absolutely look at all of the different outcomes as a result of this. But it's not just that you stop at it there. It is about what other products are likely to uh, need to be included or, or what kind of knock-on effects and negative unintended consequences you may have. And that's the nature of this whole issue is there is no one thing. We have to keep looking, keep evaluating, keep monitoring. I'll bring Chris in in a second, Dolly, but I just want to push on this sugar tax more generally. Do you think the right path now is to do another uh, levy for a, another food group and do what has been done with the sugary drinks tax, which was to calibrate it specifically with particular thresholds that you think um, manufacturers can duck under and therefore not push prices up, but just drive reformulation? Or do you think, you know, you can't do that for every single food under the sun? Don't we just need a sort of single, a single sugar tax? It's quite simple. And yes, it might push prices up a little bit, but, um, you know, it's much more sensible than having uh, 100 different sugar taxes in the in the economy. Yeah, it's a really interesting question because it is at the heart of this whole area and it's a very, very fine balance between that, you know, how, how much the reality is going to be in terms of um, putting prices up, prices of certain products up at the same time as uh, really trying to reformulate things just to make food healthier. And this is where if you go into the detail in the national food strategy, there is a lot of consideration around this and they have absolutely made crystal clear that where there are prices um, increased as a result of, a, of the sugar and salt tax that they propose in it, that absolutely has to be invested into making healthier, delicious options also more available and accessible for people, particularly on lower incomes. And the point is, again, shifting to the positive. If you only focus on this as a taking away, reducing things or whatever, and not on the fact that the reality is about increasing provision, increasing choice and access around delicious healthy food and I know that that word uh, isn't necessarily good at evoking um, images of sort of delicious food and I want to make that really clear that this isn't about making food unenjoyable this is absolutely um, you know making food the most enjoyable part of, of society we know that it is central to that and so this is about increasing the quality increasing the deliciousness for everyone and that access to it. Chris. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I mean, the the sort of hard end point and the goal of the sugar tax was to reduce obesity. Also, you, you could always quite right to mention uh, tooth decay as well. Haven't seen the figures on 
tooth decay. I know they've been falling for many decades, uh, but I have seen the figures on obesity, both childhood and adult, and there's been no effect whatsoever on on that from the sugar tax, which has now been in place for three years, I think now. The, you're quite right, obviously, about the, the reformulation. Um, I think your figures are a little bit wrong. I think I'm right in saying it was 66% um, before the sugar tax fell below the threshold for the sugar tax in terms of the sugar content, and that, I think you're right in saying, went up to 85%. Now, that had been rising for a very, very long time. Diet drinks have been around since the 1960s. They really took off in the 1980s. And there's been a gradual shift away from sugary drinks and towards the diet drinks, and also in particular to bottled water um, over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. So even before the sugar tax came in, the amount of sugar consumed from sugar drinks had fallen by about 45% over a period of 10, 12 years. Um, and one of the indicators that the sugar tax wasn't gonna have an effect on obesity is that drop didn't have any effect on obesity either. So it's not that surprising that a further increase in the number of diet drinks available hasn't made um, any difference. What it did do... But don't, but don't, was... but don't you have to look at the whole diet? I mean, if somebody, cause of course, one particular um, item of food is probably not going to make the difference. But if it's done across a, a wider set, you'd expect that to be effective, wouldn't you? Well, that's what maybe people like Jamie Oliver should have said at the time. He should have said, look, this isn't actually going to make any difference. We're pushing for it. It's going to be quite unpopular. It's going to ruin Iron Brew and LucasAid and Ribena. And Iron Brew are going to have to do a reverse ferret and launch basically the same product with a different name a couple of years later. A lot of consumers are going to dislike it. But it's not going to make any difference. However, it's just the first stepping stone to taxing the entire food supply. Uh, that would have been a more honest way to, to go about it. And, and that's I mentioned the slippery slope earlier on. You get the slippery slope partly because policies don't work. And in most areas of public policy, if you have a policy that doesn't work, it gets repealed. Or at least that's what should happen. With public health, you just do more of the same thing. So um, one area that you might possibly agree, or you indicated some possible openness to, Christopher, was around labelling. Because I think you did say that actually... Um, people are probably not uh, understanding the, the calorific intake of a particular food and, and maybe they could uh, be helped to help themselves. Um, would you accept that um, well, experimenting with different labelling schemes and actually mandating labelling schemes that are more effective, or front, you know, front of fat labelling, for instance, could be something that you get on board with because it still preserves choice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you, know, you can justify government action in this area in two possible ways. One is if there's negative externalities, and there aren't really. The other is if there's the market failure. In other words, is there something in the market that is leading people to not follow their own tastes and preferences? Uh, and the obvious one there is what economists call information asymmetry, which just means consumer ignorance, really. Um, so if people are stuffing cream cakes down their throat three times a day, uh, thinking that they're health foods, then that is a problem. And if the, the manufacturer has misled them into believing that they are not going to make them fat, then there's a, a cause for government intervention there, quite possibly. And we don't have warning labels on that many things. Cigarettes are obviously the, the obvious one. We sort of have kind of sort of labeling about pregnancy and drink driving on, on alcohol. Um, but we're not even talking about that. We're just talking about ingredients labeling. I don't think it should be controversial at all that there should be calorie labeling on all products that contain calories. I think it should be on alcohol. Um, I think it should be mandatory on food. The only reason it's not mandatory on food, by the way, is because the EU is just a hangover from the European Union. It, food labeling is, a, is an EU competence, so we couldn't do it even if we wanted to. To be fair, the voluntary system has led to the vast majority of packaged uh, food having the both the traffic light system on it and, of course, um, the ingredients. I personally think those labeling that labeling system is pretty clear. Um, I have no objection to legislation to make it mandatory across the board. I think you do need to be very careful, however, with very small cafes, restaurants, pubs, and so on. The government's already acknowledged that with its calorie labeling proposal. Um, it's just not practical for a pub to be doing a different dish of the day and having to have some chemical analysis to find out how many calories are in it. But for, for mass produced packaged foods, I see no issue with it whatsoever. As you say, there's no infringement on freedom. So long as you don't get a slippery slope to then having graphic warnings and plain packaging, which of course is a danger, or you go for idiotic ideas like having little teaspoons on each product to show how many teaspoons of sugar uh, are in it, then I, I see no issue with it at all. Dolly, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, there's a, a kind of couple of points. So um, I'll get on to the labeling um, uh, point in a, in a second. 
But on the kind of what do people want and do if they're stuffing cream cakes is just such a, a patronising image because the reality is that the kind of health halos and difficulty to navigate what is healthy, what's good, et cetera, is a very real challenge. And people, there's a lot more coming um, out on this in regards to that sort of misleading marketing at the moment. So that shouldn't be underestimated. And if you actually go to, again, the National Food Strategy ran a load of citizens assemblies. So they were engaging with people across the country, representative of the country about what they wanted. And you look at polling over so many years, people want help on this. They, they know that it's difficult to... Uh, enjoy a healthy diet for all. And there are so many different factors that contribute to why people end up um, having making the food choices that they make. And it can be so complex around what is available, what's easy, if you've got pester power, if you've got a tight budget and it's the only thing that your children will eat and that leads to certain food choices. There are so many factors in this. So the idea that you can limit this image to people stuffing their faces with cream cakes not knowing if those are healthy or not is just so inaccurate of how things actually occur and the the kind of desperation a lot of people feel on wanting it to be easy and it not to be about feeling like we're all weak-willed which we know is not the case because our moral um our moral strength hasn't changed over decades we know that the environment has on the labeling front there are two important points to make on this so Labelling is typically an intervention that's discussed as about increasing information for people to improve their choices or, or know what they're able to choose. And actually, there is uh, weak or mixed evidence on the effectiveness of that. Um, there are also discussions. Uh, I see some comments um, about uh, the sustainability agenda. There are also uh, discussions about increasing uh, information on food about the um, sustainability side of things, carbon emissions, etc. We ran some research on that and actually found that if you introduce labelling, what it can do is incentivize again, the manufacturers and the producers to realise that their products that they're serving or the things that they're serving in restaurants, for example, don't offer that many healthy options, healthy, nutritious options. So it actually can possibly lead the manufacturers, restaurants, producers to present and provide better options or even more of a balance. So that effectiveness is much more appealing because in a way it means that a consumer can go to a restaurant and not have to fight to find the healthy options or not have to try and navigate all of the different pieces of information that can be so much. And the same if they're going shopping as well. So the menu labeling or uh, front of pack labeling, whatever type of labeling thing, which is often discussed as a consumer focused thing, again, it should be focused more on or equally more on the manufacturers, producers and restaurants changing the options to, again, rebalance things so that there is a fairer choice for everyone. One of the issues that um, Christopher mentioned um, in his opening, um, opening talk was about how people tend to compensate for, uh, for things. So they might, you know, eat lower, less calories in one part of their meal, but then have um, something that's more calorific in another. And that is a real issue, isn't there, when you're thinking about sugar taxes and salt, salt taxes, Dolly? I just wanted to come ask you, how do you, how do you understand whether that compensation is happening and what, what do you do about it? Sorry, the compensation, say again, on, on the as in, side or... As in, you know, one of the risks, I guess, with, um, say you put in place a salt tax or a sugar tax, potentially the manufacturers may well reformulate, but they may well reform, reformulate with something else that is uh, cal calorie increasing. Um, so how do you actually do this in a way that doesn't have an unintended consequence whereby, um, yes, it has less salt or less sugar, but the actual calorie level is no better? Yeah, I mean, the, again, the evidence on this is so fascinating at the moment because of that question of what does reformulation end up with uh, in terms of the food that's available? Does it actually end up achieving healthier food all around because there's the whole increased attention on ultra processed foods and our understanding of how processing of foods can actually affect the way that we digest them and the health outcomes related to that is still very much emerging so it is critical that with all of this there isn't an absolute sort of promise that these again these one things are going to lead to the solution for all that there may indeed be unintended negative consequences 
And I think on the labeling front, I can't help but step back and go, you know, say you're in that food environment in a, in a supermarket or whatever. And we're so focused on just the provision of labeling on each individual product when actually what you're around is a massive disproportionate focus on options that are just unhealthy and available for all. Would you even have to have labeling like that level of detail if the balance was just massively in favor of healthy options where it doesn't really matter because you're not having to think about it that much because what's more convenient available or whatever is just healthier then consumers it's not lumped on the consumers to to be navigating that and i i sort of think about that a lot when i go around of when you start to focus on these individual labeling things as the solution one can easily forget about the wider picture. And it's like that with the reformulation as a wider picture. What is the food that is most available, most consumed as a result, most marketed, whatever? If it's not necessarily the best thing, then we still need to make sure that that is rebalanced. So what is easier for everyone? And again, coming back to my point, should it be hard to be healthy? It sort of seems crazy that we even have to make that argument. I want to bring in some questions now. So Anna Twomlow has asked, um, she'd be interested in Christopher's thoughts about limiting marketing strategies by companies to ensure that they are not infringing on choice. I'm not sure. Do you mean the limiting the marketing strategies and infringement okay. choice? So the marketing I'm, strategies themselves are an infringement choice. I could find it hard to say how marketing would be infringement of, on choice, except in some kind of Orwellian reworking of the concept of choice. Um, I, I, mean, guess what I, could, I guess what you might be getting at is, you know, marketing that targets junk food adverts at children, for instance, should we be banning those or uh, other marketing strategies? Should we actually intervene because, um, you know, you're, you're manipulating individuals to buy something that's not necessarily in their best interests? Yeah. Uh, well, we, we have the Advertising Standards Authority, which is actually pretty strict on, on these kind of things. And their watchword is that advertising has to be decent, honest and truthful. And I don't see why anybody would want to ban or restrict something that's decent, honest, and uh, truthful. I mean, for me, the, the, the marketing area is a pretty straightforward issue of, of free speech, actually. Commercial free speech doesn't get as much attention as other forms of free speech, but free speech of all kinds is, 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 is under massive attack now across the, the Western world. Um, so, yeah, so long as the uh, advertisement is not dishonest or misleading, then I don't have an issue with it all and absolutely it should be you know these companies should be allowed to get their message out there i think that what the government is proposing in terms of um of banning so-called junk food advertising is absolutely beyond the pale uh it's start we've got a bit of a conversation going at last about the fact that this is not junk food that high high in fat sugar and salt uh these products are not even high in fat sugar and salt as far as a lot of people would be concerned they're certainly not junk food and so the government then got itself into a position where they realized they were going to be inadvertently banning lots of things that people consider to be perfectly normal and healthy because they are, whether it's jam, which of course is mostly sugar, or cheese or sausages or, or whatever it may may be, raisins even. So now the government's changed the in the actual legislation. It doesn't give a definition of junk food. It just says whatever the, the Secretary of State for Health thinks is junk food is junk food, or less healthy food, I think is the term they use, less healthy food. You look, you cause all sorts of unintended consequences and problems when when you do this the 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 I think dolly sort of alluded to this before you know but action on sugar um have been amongst others including henry dimbleby been complaining in fact only yesterday were complaining about supposedly misleading um marketing on food products on baby food products specifically saying no added sugar well these products don't have any added sugar so it's not dishonest to say that if people then assume it hasn't got any sugar in it at all then that's you know that that's their it's a problem largely created by groups like action on sugar who've created this spurious distinction between added sugar and in and intrinsic sugar which actually doesn't have any scientific validity whatsoever so it scared people about added sugar companies are then using you know just fruit juice or concentrate or whatever and, and now they've been accused of misleading marketing henry dimbleby was complaining about percy pigs being marketed as having vitamin C in it. Well, they do have vitamin C in it. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? So who's who's being misleading here? The people who are telling you what's in the products and the people who are trying to stop you doing so. Dolly, do you want to come in on this? And, and just on the rationale or the, or the real reason for, to do um, a ban on junk food adverts, is it really to shift consumer behavior 
or is the real reason to do, as you were suggesting before, to shift the behavior of producers so they start to reformulate so they don't get um, restricted from advertising? If that is the case, there's a slight risk of the kind of, of a sort of intellectual dishonesty and dishonesty in the argument in that the real reason we're doing this is actually is to change the food environment and we're using instruments to to do that and, and perhaps we should be just more honest about what we're up to yeah oh, the honesty part of this is so hard because there are so many ways to frame it and that's why i'm really trying to move the focus onto the positive and the provision side and the rebalancing element of this because you know in an ideal world you wouldn't really have to have um a kind of restrictions to some extent because the balance would just be in favor of un, uh, of healthier options and i have to say on the marketing front there are so many things to say about this but i really have to point to the work of fight back uh, 2030 which is the youth led um uh, campaign organization which is calling massively for uh, the marketing and advertising of unhealthy foods to be tackled. And they very powerfully, the, the youth ambassadors, um, talk about the fact that they realise now that how heavily bombarded they are with unhealthy food adverts. And again, don't want to be. It is unhelpful when you have those triggers all of the time. And just to get under the, the hood of these marketing strategies, I remember talking to someone who had worked for one of the major um, snack companies and their marketing strategy was uh, developed around six snack points in a day. <laughs> so when you're talking about honesty around marketing, if, if the business model is designed around getting people to a six snack point per day uh, outcome, that is dishonest. And the idea that you have honesty on the packets, yes, you know, you can put vitamin C or whatever, you're not being honest about how much you're expecting consumers to buy and consume and taking zero responsibility if that's actually not what people or the world that people want to live in. And Bite Back is making the case very, very strongly that that is not something young people want. Great, thank you. Um, Anna Swamlow's come in with some um, further points on that, so do check those out in the chat. Um, I wanna turn to Kristen Bash's question now, because um, we've talked a lot about taxing um, but what about actually reducing the cost of healthy foods? So she's asked, what do speakers think of subsidizing fresh healthy foods, fruits, veg, whole grains as the other side of taxation? Um, Christopher, is this equally objectionable as taxing because it's going to have to come from um, a, another tax to subsidize these things? Yeah, what well, it would do, yeah. So it's, it's indistinguishable in, in many respects with regards to the, the consequences for people. It's also totally impractical. I mean, you hear people saying this sometimes. Oh, okay, well, let's not tax the unhealthy stuff. Let's just make the, the, the healthy stuff cheaper. How are you actually going to do that, given that the government doesn't control the price of food in this country? I can't see any way to do it, which at the very least would leave you wide open to fraud. Um, because somebody would have to decide what the kind of natural price is and then you give it to who? The farmers, the supermarkets? I don't, I, I don't understand how, how it would even work. I guess you could give food stamps to people that could only be used to, to spend on, on fruit and vegetables. Um, that, they do do that in America. It's quite controversial, but they, they do it. Um, so it's it's impractical. And as you say, it's commensurate to, to a tax on people who are not buying these products. It's also totally unnecessary because fruit and vegetables are really, really cheap. And there's this weird kind of delusion amongst a lot of people, including and especially in public health, that it's really expensive to, to eat you know, potatoes and carrots and peas. Well, it, it isn't. There are, of course, expensive vegetables if you want to go down the exotic end of the market. But there's a reason that the poor of the world have had vegetables as their staple diet for in whole, all of human history. And that is because they're, they're really cheap and they've never been cheaper than they are now. It, people are not neglecting to buy fruit and vegetables because they can't afford it. They're doing it because they, they don't really like the taste of them. And most vegetables actually don't taste very nice. And most people, including myself, don't have the cooking skills to make them taste nice. If you want to give people the cooking skills so they can make a nice vegetable casserole or whatever, then feel free. We'll see if they, they follow through with that in later life, but it's got nothing to do with the price here. We're gonna cause enormous problems if you just think this is an issue of affordability and relative cost. I'm very concerned about the idea of taxing salt, for example. We've got people here who don't really understand what's going on. 
Uh, they don't really understand if you ask them how why obesity has risen in the first place. It, there's no relationship with sugar, which is the main target at the moment, because sugar consumption has gone down a lot since the 1970s, just as obesity has gone up. What would be the consequence? In fact, what has been the consequence of reducing salt intake? Well, according to Graham McGregor, who does all the research in this area and is a big campaigner for it, it's all been a tremendous success. But this is a clear example of somebody marking their own homework. The evidence on the optimal amount of uh, salt in the human diet is extremely shaky, as I understand it. And the other thing about salt is it doesn't have any calories in it. It's about the only part of the food supply that doesn't have any calories. So it's actually a very good way of making food taste nice without adding calories. You take the salt out and you have to put something that has got calories in it. So we're messing around here, I think, with forces that we don't truly understand. And I hate to invoke the, the precautionary principle, but I think before we let a load of public health people with, loose with their half-baked ideas, we should really look very carefully at what the unintended consequences are going to be, including, in final point, on people who um, suffer from anorexia and uh, malnutrition. If the government's reformulation uh, scheme works in the way that it intends to, which is to reduce everybody's calorie intake by a set amount, the consequences for people who are under, underweight would be quite profound. Fortunately, of course, it won't work. But if it did work, it would, be, uh, it would have serious negative consequences. Um, Dolly, there's loads in there that you could comment on. Feel free to either comment on, um, is it practical to actually subsidize and make healthy foods cheaper? But I think the other point that Christopher made is interesting, which is it, it, it does feel harder to actually um, introduce a salt tax than say a sugar tax, because there are potentially more unintended consequences. Would you, would you be more cautious on, on that? Well, I'll come on to the subsidy uh, point first. Um, and I always, I just have to say, Chris, it makes me want to cook for you. The idea that you think <laughs> vegetables are disgusting makes me sad. Um, I feel like you clearly haven't had <laughs> meals. So, um, I mean, and that is, it is so subsidies already happen. And we've got the Healthy Start Scheme, for example, uh, where vouchers are, are provided to, to low income families. And there are various things like that. There have been lots of schemes, again, out of the many hundreds of policies that have been proposed over the last 30 years on that sort of free provision of fruit and veg, et cetera, et cetera. Supermarkets have done it as well. But it's not enough to get at the real issue around why um, fruit and vegetables aren't actually all, all healthier foods. I'm definitely moving away from just fruit and vegetables being the only idea of healthier foods. Healthier foods are, are, are not um, as cheap is because we're talking about the fact that when it's convenient and set against each other as a fair choice related to calories and convenience and accessibility and all of those things, that's when it's harder. And so just talking about raw ingredients is not an accurate reflection of what is meant by uh, access to uh, affordable, convenient, healthy options. And any research that has been done on this area really does demonstrate that when people try and shift towards a diet of uh, healthier foods, that they can end up being more expensive when you're looking at it calorie to calorie or when you're looking at it around uh, convenience um, issues. So that's a really clear distinction. And it's a case that's made often by opposition arguments that you can just cook. But the reality is there are many reasons why that doesn't um, happen. And it's not necessarily just because people don't know how to cook. When uh, we live in a culture of convenience and things available at all options, even people that cook don't necessarily do it. So just reducing the idea of choice, again, too simplistically, uh, misses lots of important uh, considerations within that. On the salt uh, tax side, yes, the unintended consequences need to be addressed. I think it comes back, I'll end up repeating myself, comes back to exactly what I was saying before about all of these things, that the shift must be stepping back and looking at what options are around us um, in terms of the balance towards the healthier and making sure that it's not lost in that detail where you end up uh, on very real uh, feasibility and practicality issues around some of the reformulation, rather than just looking at what, um, how we can shift an environment so that what is most available um, is the healthy option. So sticking with uh, Christopher's culinary competence or, or lack thereof, um, there is a question in the in, in the chat about um, from, let me find it again, it's uh, Kim Townsend. What do the panelists think about education's role in terms of nutritious food and preventing obesity at, an early, at the early years? And I think there's another question along the similar lines about um, education for, for behavior change. Um, well, first of all, Chris, would you, would, you, would you back that? That's something that doesn't infringe any, on any choice. Should we be educating people on how to, 
to make and eat nutritious food. Yeah, of course. I think mean, that's a perfectly reasonable part of home economics or whatever they call it these days. Um, whether it makes much of a difference in the long term, I, I really don't know. But it's certainly true that people like me don't know how to cook. It's also true that people like me don't really want to cook. And Dolly dismisses convenience as, as almost being uh, a negative thing. Convenience is a very good thing. Not everybody wants to spend an hour and a half cooking the meal. Some people do. And that's great. And it does tend to be the people who like doing it who are most keen for the government to intervene. That's why you've got so many celebrity chefs, not just Oliver, but um, Hugh Fernley, Whittingstall, Prudley, and all these people. They're, they're obsessed with food. Fair enough. They're, they're restaurateurs. They're cooks. Um, they're, Chris, it's I have their to, passion. I have, it's I not something everybody... I have to correct you on the convenience point because I didn't say that convenience is is a, is a negative thing. It's just that what is convenient or what is most likely to be convenient tends to be unhealthier options. So absolutely, if we can have convenient, healthier options, Fantastic. Well, I don't see. I don't see what they what they would involve. Um, I mean, the, the point somebody's making in the comments here is that you know if you add in the, the time it takes to cook and the, the acquiring the cooking skills, then it works out more 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 expensive. Well, that that is is true, I guess. If you're going to compare it to um, a, a pizza that you fling in the oven, it's obviously not true if you're comparing it to another a meal that you would that you would cook at home. The cooking time is likely to be um, very similar, but. You know, convenience is a good thing. Uh, time is precious, and a lot of us don't want to spend a huge amount of time cooking. Um, and that is a perfectly reasonable choice to make. And if it means you make, means you put on a few pounds, which I would say is still actually quite debatable, then that's up to you. If you want to eat, you know, healthy and convenient, you can you can munch on a raw carrot. A bag of carrots costs forty p. You can eat one like a horse if you want to. My daughter does that. She's quite happy munching around a carrot. Again, it's not for me. It's not for everybody. But we're all different, aren't we? Um, Dolly, what's the actual evidence on whether education? can help um, either people to cook better or choose better convenience food? Uh, I mean, it's not the evidence on 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 education programmes is not my area. Um, but I absolutely I mean, it's funny enough, politically, in terms of the which is my area more on on the on the policy side is it is an area that pretty much everyone agrees needs to be done. And it's kind of fascinating how when you start to look into why those barriers occur within government around education-based policies, there's sadly quite a lot of pushback from, or has been a certainly a lot of pushback from the Department of Health over the years of not feeling like health is really their issue. And there are lots of other things that, you know, that department has to focus on. And that's a major barrier that one sees when it comes to getting policy change across government is that other government departments outside of the Department of Health and maybe Downing Street, if the, if the Prime Minister at the time is really focused on it, don't necessarily always feel like health is their responsibility. And even more than that, they may actually see that certain policies that are being proposed uh, jar with the policies that they have in their given department or vested interest in their given department, which was very much the case on advertising for many years. So politically, the evidence on, on education-based outcomes is that there is a barrier within government on having all departments feel like health is their responsibility or, is, or they have a role, a very key role to play in that. And that is certainly something that uh, prevents policy change happening when it, when it really should and could. Okay, thanks. We, we are, as ever, all the questions are coming right at the end, um, but we are, we've got to wrap up. I just want to ask one final question of both of you. We've been sort of having a go at this argument now for the last hour. I'm interested in your predictions about the politics of food going forward. Um, and Christopher, do you think your, you know, your perspective is winning out and that there is a backlash that's growing and, and or, or do you actually think you're losing the argument? And, and likewise, Dolly, do you, are you an optimist about, um, political and policy progress in this area, or do you fundamentally think it's, you know, no one's actually going to do what's needed? Well, I'm, I'm very, I'm certainly not optimistic. My side's winning. My side's never winning. Um, and the, you know, the, the raft of measures that the Johnson's already announced, you know, they are pretty much unprecedented. I don't think they'll want to do any more for the time being. Um, I th and I think there's going to be quite a few negative consequences from the policies we've already introduced, in particular, the 24 hour digital online ban for so-called junk food advertising. You're going to just pick up so many cases where companies are producing food that 
almost any normal person considers to be perfectly healthy a, a ban from advertising. And that's what you saw with the London Underground ban. So uh, hopefully there'll be some kind of backlash about that. They have, in fairness, had to water down quite a few of those proposals in the light of reality. And maybe they've learned the lesson on this that you shouldn't just take uh, you know, a wish list of measures from people in public health because they, they're not really in touch with the real world. But in the long term, I mean, we're only going in one direction, aren't we? Everything's getting more nanny states. The only prospect of any kind of liberalization in any area is, is probably cannabis. Um, but no, I mean, smoking is going to be banned sooner or later and alcohol tax is going to go up and the advertising for that's probably going to be banned. And we'll probably see more taxation in the food supply. Um, apart from anything else, the government needs the money. And I wouldn't worry, my final point, I really wouldn't be worried about food being too cheap over the next few years. The economy is about to collapse again over the next 12 months. We're going to have a massive inflation problem, interest rates, cost of living crisis. People in public health in their ivory towers will still be talking about how food's too cheap, but the rest of society will be trying to get the costs down. Thank you. Um, Dolly, final word for you. Uh, I, am I an optimist? Yes. And are things moving in a direction where policies are more likely to lead to action and they're more likely to be leading to better pu public health outcomes? Yes. So hopefully that will continue. And I think anyone watching that is keen to be part of that, absolutely uh, be encouraged to do so. And uh, thank you also for opening debates like this, because I think it's so important that we keep attention on this issue up as it is critical. Thank you very much. Thank you both for joining us. I thought it was a really interesting conversation and it's great to sort of challenge our assumptions on this. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is one of our three big missions that we're focused on. So do keep in touch uh, to hear more from the team on the work over the next few years. Uh, Dolly, Chris, thanks very much. And thanks to all the audience for great questions. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Ravi. Cheers.